Hello and welcome to Projector and on this installment the Angry Birds are back for their second movie and this time they have to join forces with their enemies, the pigs. Red, voiced by Jason Sudeikis, is a hero to the inhabitants of Bird Island after the events of the first film as they continue their prank war with the adjacent Piggy Island led by Bill Hader's Leonard. When Piggy Island is attacked by an ice ball, they realise that there is a third isle, the snowy Eagle Island led by Leslie Jones' Zeta, who plans to take over the sunnier neighbouring islands. Leonard calls a truce with Red and now birds and pigs assemble a team including Josh Gaz Chuck and his brainy sister Silver, voiced by Rachel Bloom, Danny McBride's Bob, Aquafina's Courtney, Sterling K. Brown's Gary, and Peter Dinklage's Mighty Eagle to stop Zeta and her super weapon. The Angry Birds movie shouldn't have worked. It was a film based off of a smartphone game that barely had a story to begin with. By all logic, it should have been completely terrible. And yet most people came out of it probably thinking, well, that wasn't all that bad. Certainly, that was my thoughts at the time. I went into it with the very lowest of expectations and found myself slightly surprised to find that I was actually giggling at some of the jokes. And by the time they worked in the video game mechanic of characters slingshotting themselves over to Piggy Island, that was actually surprisingly fun to watch. Now, don't get me wrong. This is not me claiming that the Angry Birds movie is good. It's not. It's fairly obnoxious for a start. But in terms of video game adaptations, it's probably one of the best, which says more about those than it does about the Angry Birds movie. But it was a big hit with kids and family audiences. It made $350 million at the worldwide box office, therefore guaranteeing a sequel was inevitable, despite the fact that it's essentially a glorified advertisement for the video game. For this sequel, we have an all-new creator team. The film is directed by Thrup Van Orman, the creator of the Cartoon Network series The Marvelous Misadventures of Flapjack and John Rice, both of them making their directorial debuts here and obviously the thinking is how exactly do we do a follow-up to a video game adaptation that we barely stretched out to one movie and the simple answer is just get weird with it and that's exactly what the angry birds movie 2 does it's a good approximation of a writer's room that's heavily over caffeinated to give a suitably fitting metaphor the plot such as it is is the elastic band on the slingshot it's only there to provide a frenzy of jokes upon audiences to the point of sensory overload and that analogy there is probably more used to the game's dynamic than the film itself does it abandons the slingshot idea roughly around 10 minutes in and just appropriates the character into this cartoon adventure narrative. It leans into the absurdity of the form. It's very Looney Tunes inspired in a lot of ways and pushes it to the point where it's borderline surrealist. So for older audiences who are taking their kids to see this, they might be surprised just how much they laugh at it. Yes, the film is very scattershot to say the least. There are quite a few jokes that do whiff, but also there are some that really do hit the target. And those audiences might be surprised at just how much they're actually quite clever, but also catch you off guard, sometimes in how mean-spirited they can be in an amusing way. There's definitely at least one sequence which might might actually be one of the funniest sequences I've seen in any film all year and it's part of this very long stretch where the characters are disguised in a makeshift eagle costume and it's this long sequence where they're inside a bathroom trying to steal a key card and that whole physical comedy and escalation over the course of it is genuinely hysterical it really is the funniest two minutes of the film and it works out so brilliantly a lot of the slapstick here is genuinely inspired in large part because the animation works so well with it. And you can tell the animators are having a lot of fun with the film's visual and physical comedy. There's a flexibility here that you don't commonly see in a lot of CG animation where they're playing around with space and perspective and physics, whatever suits the joke at any given moment. So there'll be a minor amount of discontinuity from shot to shot occasionally where characters suddenly move closer together or maybe a space might seem bigger in one shot. It's all to serve the slapstick at any given moment and all in service of maybe appropriating something closer to a 2D cartoon animation style and in general the animation here is bright colourful and very, very active. It's very nice to look at. And the jokes are definitely aimed at different sections of the audience. So yes, there's ones aimed at adults, but there's a lot of them aimed primarily towards kids. And 
to that end, there's a lot of stuff to do with the pigs, which is undeniably influenced by the minions. The film all but admits that. There's a sequence where they're on board a submarine and they go into the research centre and the pigs are working on various different gadgets. And that's a scene almost literally out of a Despicable Me movie. And they pretty much want to replicate that formula in that the pigs have a lot of jokes that maybe a little bit rude, but not totally inappropriate for its target audience. There's a lot of jokes about bottoms, there's a lot of jokes about pigs in spandex, and there's a lot of dancing over the course of the film. And sometimes it does toe the line somewhat. There is a sequence where Leonard's photos on his phone maybe gets a little bit too close to going into adult territory, but that's definitely the line that these films want to try and stay on. And the other part that shows just how much this film is geared towards its younger audience is that it very rarely sits still. It's always changing things up, trying to refresh their attention. It's a very lively experience. And to that end, this movie has frequent needle drops. I don't think I've heard a soundtrack that samples so much since Suicide Squad. And it makes for a very bizarre soundtrack because it's so disparate. You've got scenes that are accompanied by Turn Down For What? You've got 80s classics like The Final Countdown to accompany a countdown sequence naturally. There's a flashback to the 90s that's accompanied by I don't want to wait for our lives to be over, you know, the Dawson's Creek theme. It gets to a very odd point where there's a breakdance battle accompanied by Axel F of all things. And at a certain point it does start to feel like a very lazy crutch because pretty much every two minutes there'll be some part of licensed music that comes onto the soundtrack to just add a punchline to a joke and for an older audience I'd imagine that gets really tiresome real quick and certainly it does border on the obnoxious for me. Of course what you won't find is a whole lot of story and when I heard this was directed by a Cartoon Network alumni it suddenly made a lot of sense to me because this does feel like a 20 minute episode stretched and expand out to 90 through sheer force of jokes and there are things that are going on here for example Red's anxiety once again takes center stage in that now that he's the hero he feels the need to live up to that moniker he's afraid that if he fails if he lets people down they'll shun him and hate him like they once did it's that anxiety that I think many lonely people have felt at one time or another and as such he adopts this very selfish mindset in that I'm the one who's taking charge I'm gonna take on this threat and I'm gonna do it single-handedly and I don't need anyone else to do so and of course that doesn't work out for him and he has to learn over the course of the film that he does have to cede authority to other people that he needs to work as a team it's not simply a solo effort and to that end that also links with the film's other main theme in that it tries to be in some way topical and relevant to our current climate in that it's definitely preaching towards an element of reconciliation of trying to bring both sides together for a mutual shared cause there is that element that is represented in the plot in that the birds and the pigs are now working together and you would think given that they were in conflict for so long that that would actually kind of crop up a bit more than it really does. Aside from a little bit of bickering between Red and Leonard, it seems like both sides really do get on very well with each other, which I think it's a little bit odd considering when you remember that the pigs were trying to eat the bird's children in the last movie. I mean, they seem very forgiving of that. I'm, I'm just saying. It just seems like that. And of course, that reconciliation theme can be felt all across the rest of the film. But these two ideas are there but they're not really the main focus because of course the humor is that and so they often feel a little bit underdeveloped you especially feel about the conflict between the birds and the pigs that they could have expanded on that just a little bit more 
if only to give this film maybe a little bit more backbone than it has in its current incarnation. And clearly the filmmakers were aware of how slight their story was because they add in this subplot about a group of young hatchlings, two of which are voiced by Nicole Kidman and Keith Urban's children. They take their unborn brothers and sisters, they take those eggs, and then they accidentally get swept out to sea and they have to sail off after them, which sets off a number of misadventures along the way. These are essentially self-contained vignettes. If you've seen the Ice Age movies and the scrat sequences within them, they function in exactly the same way. that They break up the story every so often for a little comedy side piece. And this is where most of the wilder, more far out elements of the movie lie and some of the funnier bits are in these sequences that are actually quite inventive in their own way and they also serve as a reiteration of the film's themes of reconciliation in a microcosm way. And it eventually links into the main storyline at the very, very end of the film, but mostly this just goes along entirely all by itself. And you do get the impression that while this is some of the better material in the movie, you also think at the back of your mind that I know the reason that this is there is because this is to have had it out for another 15 minutes to get up to 90 minutes as opposed to 70. This movie also has an absurdly packed voiceover cast. There are so many names in this film just fighting for that little bit of screen time. Jason Sudeikis makes a welcome return as Red. I think this sarcastic, bitter voiceover will be most appreciated by older viewers, especially because he adds a welcome counterbalance to the obnoxious OTT antics found elsewhere. I think that his world weariness will be echoed in the parents that have been dragged to see this film. Although again, he's not really an angry bird. He's just more of a disgruntled one at best. Most of the other performers they brought back from the first film are given much smaller roles though. In some cases, that's probably an improvement. Josh Gad is far less grating and obnoxious as the speed freak Chuck because he's given far less of the spotlight this time out. Similarly, Danny McBride's bomb is much more in the background. Even Bill Hader hamming it up as Lennon just kind of falls into the same group dynamic that the rest of the cast members fall into. There are some new pig characters this time out. For example, you've got Aquafina and Sterling K. Brown. Brown, in particular, seems desperate to add some sort of character to his Gadget Man, but really, these are just simply tagging along for the ride. They don't really do anything over the course of the narrative other than just be there while they're on the mission, and honestly, could have been written out entirely. They're so desperate to try and add some more voiceover names, even though they don't really have much to do. Peter Dinklage also comes back as the cowardly mighty eagle, who serves something of a key figure in the film's plot, but is mostly sidelined until the very, very end of the film. There are two new characters, though, that do stand out. One of them is Leslie Jones's Zeta. You can tell that Jones is having a whale of a time voicing the villain and getting to practice her maniacal laugh. She's just sick and tired of her icy conditions and all she's had to put up with, and now she just wants sunnier climbs. She wants something for herself. At a certain certain point, it's all about me time. And Jones just seems to be enjoying playing this vernously selfish character. The other one that stands out is Chuck's sister Silver, this engineering inventor type voiced by Rachel Bloom, and she gets a lot of prominence in the film's narrative. And I initially didn't like this character because she's introduced in a speed dating sequence where she brushes up against Rare, they have this antagonistic relationship, and she deems him incompatible, and you know exactly where that's heading. They're going to build it towards a romantic relationship, which is really predictable, and that whole first scene is totally unnecessary. It doesn't need to be there. It, again, just pads the movie out slightly, but after that point, I did start to like her character, mostly because she is the most intelligent and competent member of the cast. They don't play her up mostly for comedy, and so 
by that part, she actually stands out in the film a lot, and I really like her character. I think that she is probably the best of the new additions. But even in the supporting cast, there's loads and loads of named talent completely unnecessarily. For example, Maya Rudolph reprises her role from the first film, but she needs a board because she's barely in it. She doesn't follow them on the mission, she simply stays behind, unless she only has a handful of lines. You've also got Dove Cameron voicing one of the birds, Eugenio Debert voicing some of the eagle guards. Nicki Minaj turns up doing a bizarre but surprisingly decent British accent for some reason, and she's got two, three lines tops. And even Tiffany Haddish turns up very, very late into the film. And these roles are essentially bit parts. Why would you hire talented, recognisable individuals for roles that could have been adequately filled by actual voice actors. It makes absolutely no sense, especially because they're not promoting this film as featuring those talents, they're simply essentially just providing cameos. It's very, very bizarre, and just adds to a sense of the film being very, very clustered. It just feels like everyone is just competing for a little bit of screen time, and as such, I feel that a lot of very talented comedians comedians are wasted by this. The Angry Birds Movie 2 is about on the same level as its predecessor, if not slightly better. If my audience was anything to go by, then kids will absolutely love this film. It's very much geared towards their sense of humour, but adults may find they'll be laughing at it just a little bit more than they expected to. So in that way, if you're looking for something to take the family out to, if you're looking for a distraction for 90 minutes, you could certainly do a heck of a lot worse than this. It's no classic, and we know that some Sony Pictures animation is capable of far better than this, this isn't exactly Spider-Verse, but there's enough sparks of wit and invention that it passes 90 minutes by fairly breezily, but it is also extremely disposable. It's not going to be something that sticks in the memory, it's deliberately designed to be forgettable, but for the most part, it hits the target, which isn't bad for what is essentially a video game commercial. The Angry Birds Movie 2 is a brasher, louder, and at times more obnoxious sequel that uses its threadbare adventure plot merely as an excuse for a barrage of hit and miss jokes, mixing amusing set pieces with kid pleasing jokes about dancing, bottoms, and pigs in spandex. Even the adults in the audience might find themselves laughing at a few moments because it goes into some very odd places for humour, but the film is definitely aimed at short attention spans, especially as this has the most needle drops since Suicide Squad used to punctuate jokes every few minutes. What little story there is was strands about Red's insecure hero complex and overcoming differences is underdeveloped and simply there to push the plot along, even adding a recurring Ice Age-esque subplot about hatchlings to inflate things up to feature length. The incredibly star-stirred voice cast are simply overcrowded as the team focus of the film means that few stand out and some are only given a handful of lines, with the main highlight being Rachel Bloom's smart new character Silver, but this is a busier but thinner sequel that provides a brief distraction like the game it's based on. If you like this review then slingshot yourself over to my Patreon, where you can see my reviews early, among other perks, including access to my Discord server. But until next time, I'm Matthew Buck, fading out. Wow.